to worship with you. And um, I want to share a little bit about where I got the topic of our conversation, of our uh, focus of our sermon today. So we launched our live groups a couple of weeks ago, and we are doing this book. It's called Discipleship Essentials. And after the first week, I checked in with a bunch of our live group leaders, and there was one point of conversation that seemed like it came up in all the groups. So I'm going to show you the definition that we looked at, and I want you to see if you can guess what part of this definition of discipleship ended up being a point of tension for a lot of our small groups. So can we put that up there? So the first, so Greg Ogden, he's the author of the book, and, and the first chapter we got into is like, what's it mean to be a disciple? So he says, a disciple is one who responds in faith and obedience to the gracious call to follow Jesus Christ. Being a disciple is a lifelong process of dying to self while allowing Jesus Christ to come alive in us. Any guesses about which part of that definition became one that people wanted to discuss a little bit more? What do you think? Yes. That has been the least hard question I've asked. Both services, people were like, we know which one. All right, and let's look at the scripture that went with that. So the scripture that went along with that conversation was Luke 9, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 23 through 26. And Jesus says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, let lose, yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. All right, so as I checked in with all our live group leaders, they all said this uh, denying yourself, this dying to yourself is a point of tension. And I said, get over it. No, that's not what I said. I, I said, well, I want us to take time then to tease it apart. So can we sit with this a little bit? Can we talk about why we have tension with this and what we can do with that? So... The first thing, the first reason I think that um, we have tension with this is because if you grew up in any kind of um, certain church denominations can be really intense and really duty motivated and really about rules and really your memory and experience of growing up in them is that mostly people were interested in telling you the rules and then judging you for not keeping them. Now, not everyone grew up in that denomination, but I kind of grew up in that situation. So let me show you a little bit of my experience and see if that rings familiar at all for some of you. Now, if you didn't, praise God. Hold on to your liberation. But some of us grew up in, I grew up in a denomination. We were a little unusual. Like we worshiped from, uh, on Saturdays. And, and we worshiped from Saturday sunset, or Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. And you started with a church service on Friday. And then you had Sabbath school at 9 on Saturday. And then you were in church at and then you didn't spend money, you didn't watch TV, you didn't listen to the radio during the Sabbath, and then you were going to be with your youth group all day long. Also, you were going to get your, peer, your ears pierced, um, my ears still aren't pierced because that was like a little of the world, right? There was a lot of anxiety about the world was going to get you. Like if you, before Harry Potter, there was like a lot of suspicion about like a wrinkle in time, you know, and like they're reading certain like science fiction books might like turn you from the face. I grew up in a small Korean immigrant church. Now, I love my people, and I love being Korean-American, but, you know, every culture's got some pros and cons. And one thing about, like, Korean culture is we're highly duty-motivated people. And so it wasn't so much about, like, what's bringing you joy or, like, where might the invitation from Jesus be, but you combine, like, this intense denomination and this culture, and it, you really got that feeling that people were watching you. And that there was a lot of joy being sucked out of the room. And a lot of people spending time talking about other people in the church who were not doing the things that they needed to do. Do you know what I'm saying? And so then when you come from a space like that and you hear deny yourself, internally you're like, I feel all the fun and joy being sucked out of my life. And I definitely feel like I'm going to be forced to like obey stuff that doesn't really make sense to me why I should do it, but like people are going to judge me if I don't. If you come from that background, I can see that maybe if we read this scripture, it may not sound very appealing. Yes? Anyone relate to that? Like anyone come from a little bit of that in your background? I think there's another end of the spectrum too, why when we hear phrases like this, we are not into it. And I would say it's because phrases like deny yourself, 
um, or dying to self seem like they often get used against folks on the margins. So like, uh, you know, as an Asian American woman, the stereotype of like Asian American women is that like, we just really want to speak softly and like we're very subservient and like want to do menial tasks and stuff. And it was weird to me how it was like when I was in spaces where people would think about denying yourself, it always ended up like maintaining the status quo. It meant like the white pastor was going to stay in power and I was supposed to help him do that. Like why is denying yourself always mean you stay in charge and I am your backup dancer to that show? And I just thought, I don't like deny myself when it's always used to keep people systemically on the margins. Do you know what I'm saying? So when I hear that, I'm also like, I'm not really, I don't, I don't like where this is going. And that's happened, you know, not just to Asian American women, it happens ac across a variety of systems. So I think that, at least for me, I can immediately understand why when we see these passages, we have a little bit of tension. The other thing for me, why I don't like it is, in addition to just like maintaining gender status quo, I feel around race stuff, when people talk about denying yourself, I found often in the church what they really meant was white folks will stay in power, people of color will labor to educate them, and then when that white person goes on to write a book about like race, they'll go and make some of that white people race consultant money while I'm over here as like the emotionally exhausted person of color who like taught them that stuff and is trying to scrounge money for therapy so I can get better <laughs> after that like dysfunctional relationship <laughs> and so when people are like deny yourself and it's about the way it plays out with race and gender and duty I think that's some of why we kind of don't like that conversation relate to any of those yeah. all right so we have seen some toxic versions about that and the question I have is how do we follow a Jesus that is here to liberate us but also calls us to deny ourselves how do we hold both and not just dismiss because we've had negative experiences with it for me, I look to one of my role models to think about that because I think one thing we can do is if we've had a negative experience or we've come across an expression of certain theology that wasn't adequate, we either stay stuck in it or we throw it away. And I want to lean on, it's Black History Month, and I want to reach out to one of my heroes as a model that I think can help us in a moment like this. This is one of my favorite people in all of Earth. If you have not read the autobiography of Malcolm X, I feel sad for you because it's amazing. And he is an amazing leader. And what I read, when I first read uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X in high school, you know, this is like in the 90s, you know, like talking about white supremacy, like you see that on Twitter like every four seconds. But in the 90s, like the way, when I read how he talked about whiteness and systems of whiteness, I was like, what? I had never heard anyone just say it like it was. He's so passionate, he's so focused. He had so much clarity. And if you read his autobiography, he's just also like a lot of uh, empathy and compassion. He's a very complex person. And he, what he, if you don't know some of his story, I mean, he was definitely like running out in them streets. He like ended up in jail. He has a really significant conversion experience and gets involved with this movement called the Nation of Islam, which is different than like traditional Islam uh, in a lot of ways, but is kind of like an offshoot subset. And over time becomes essentially the most well-known face of that movement, right? So he becomes the one of the, the best-known spokesperson probably in this country and internationally. And he is known for his just super direct, incisive clarity and critique of whiteness. And he is about like, and he loves his people, and he loves black people, and he's about black people being for black people. Love all of this. What happens though, after a few years into this, is he realizes that there's actually some flaws in the organization that he's a part of, and he takes a really significant trip to Mecca. So as folks who are Muslim are supposed to do at some point in their life. And when he's there, he has these really pivotal interactions with folks that look white to him. Like he said, you can see he's having kind of like this transform, he's like, this blonde, he's like, I think he's Arab, but he's blonde haired and blue eyes and he's Muslim and he is extending a kind of hospitality to me that I've never experienced before. And people open up their homes to him and people treat him with this kind of solidarity and brotherhood that it literally forces him in the course of a couple weeks to totally rethink and change how he thinks about race relations. It isn't that he changes his mind about the critique of racism in the United States, but he realizes that that's just one slice of the puzzle. And he also realizes that his understanding of Islam has been narrow. 
And so he comes back and literally begins to share about how he is changing his approach to how he is going to do some of his work. Now, I think it would be really easy if you were as outspoken as Malcolm X and as well known for being a spokesperson who sees things a certain way, to not have the courage to say you learned something new, so now you're gonna do it differently. But that is what Malcolm X models for us. And what I think is so interesting is I'm so curious, I w one of the great tragedies of his assassination is, I don't think we know where he would have ended up if his life hadn't been cut short because he was right in the middle of an evolution. And so when I think about this, your de de definition of discipleship, when I think about us thinking about denying ourselves, I look at someone like Malcolm X and I say, can I, like him, continue to learn more and then do differently because I know more? Instead of being stuck in the definition of deny myself that maybe I learned in 10th grade, or maybe that traumatized me when I was in college, can I learn more and continue to do differently as a result of that? Amen? So I'm reaching out to Malcolm X so that we can reclaim this idea of denying ourselves. And instead of just saying, I've had toxic experiences with it, I'm going to come to it and reclaim it in the name of Jesus. So we don't want to claim the toxic thing. So here's what we know. In ter so what, where do we go with this? One of the first things I would say is even though when we hear deny yourself, your first response to that is like, but I don't like to deny myself. <laughs> I like pizza. <laughs> I like, right, you know, when you hear deny yourself, you just think like, what is everything I like and I don't get to have it anymore and then I have to sit around and be sad about not having, I don't know why, I just can only think of pizza right now. It's the only <laughs> thing I like. I've been on a low carb situation. Um, <laughs> but we know when we look at other people, if they haven't learned to deny themselves, we know that that's not pleasant to be around. We actually, as much as we personally resist it, we actually very much believe that everyone should learn to deny themselves. Let me give some examples. Have you ever been in a friendship with somebody who cannot deny themselves their desire to gossip? And does that get tiring after a while? Have you ever been friends with somebody or been the person who can't seem to stop getting into super drama-filled relationships because you keep choosing drama-filled people to be in relationship with and then wonder how you keep ending up in drama-filled situations? Baby, it's you. You're the common factor in all those relationships. <laughs> but you can't deny yourself these unhealthy patterns. Have you ever been around somebody who can't deny their, uh, have you ever been around a leader that can't deny their need for control? Have you ever been around a parent who can't <laughs> deny their need to use angry words or to use their hands? We have all been around people who don't know how to deny themselves and we know that that's toxic. We know we actually want to live in a world of people who have learned to deny their base impulses. And so we can't say, I want to live in a world where everyone else does that, but me, no. We have to agree that that's just a better way to proceed, is that we all learn to deny ourselves in some way. Amen? Amen. And honestly, you will keep yourself out of a lot of messes if you can do that. The other thing is we have to remember that Jesus doesn't start here. See, one of the things when we hear deny ourselves, we feel like that's as if Jesus like landed on earth and he was like, hello, deny yourself. <laughs> but that's not where the story starts. We got to think we're in Luke chapter nine. Where does the story start? It starts with an angel appearing to Mary, this illiterate girl in the middle of nowhere saying, I'm going to let you partner with the living God so that you can give birth to God incarnate on earth. And Mary takes that experiences and exegetes her own lived experience and what is happening to her body and creates this prophetic piece of theology. That's how this kingdom gets started. And then she goes and hangs out with Elizabeth. And these two women build this crazy, prophetic, multi-generational, woman-centered community. And that's how this kingdom gets started. And then when Jesus shows up, he doesn't start with deny me. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to be good news to the poor, the oppressed, those in prison, those who can't see. So he doesn't start with deny yourself. He starts by revealing himself. And when he reveals himself, the more he reveals, the more he invites you one step closer. So when he shows up to Peter and Peter is in his boat fishing, he doesn't actually ask. He asks a favor of Peter. Peter, can I sit in your boat and preach from there? 
God, Jesus is creating mutuality when there doesn't have to be mutuality. And he's saying, I know what Peter's world is about. Peter's world is about fishing. I'm going to get into Peter's world. And so after he preaches, he says, hey, Peter, why don't you drop your nets into the water? And Peter's like, I've been fishing all night. And to catch no fish. Right after loud sermons on the water is not prime fishing time, but because you say so, I'll drop my nets. And what I love is that's enough for Jesus. Jesus isn't like, you have to obey me with a great attitude. He just like, <laughs> Jesus is like, you have too petty of an attitude. I'm not going to even do that miracle no more because you came like that, right? I think if Jesus didn't count obedience with an attitude, we'd all be in a, in a rough spot. So just know, Jesus understands obedience with an attitude. And he's like, don't worry, Peter, I got you. The nets go in and they just overflow with fish. And the thing he's saying is, before he invites Peter to come into his world, he goes into Peter's world. And he goes, I have authority over the thing you think you know best. Now that I have revealed this about myself, would you like to drop your nets and follow me? I'll teach you how to do this with people. Revelation, invitation. And the journey continues. What happens next? He talks about a world where everything is upside down. Blessed are the poor. Woe to the rich. People don't like to preach that half of the sermon. He says, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. These laws weren't made, these laws, Sabbath was made for man, not man for Sabbath. Laws were made to serve people, not for you to be a slave to them. He talks about radical forgiveness. He shows that he's so powerful when he talks to creation, creation remembers the voice that spoke it into being and obeys him. He gets in a boat and goes across a lake so he can cast a thousand demons out of a man that's so tormented, he's basically been living in a, in a, in a tombs, living in a graveyard. And he liberates this man from a thousand demons that have been torturing him. That is a crazy revelation of power. But when the people in that village are scared by what he sh what the, the power that's revealed, they go, we wish you would leave. And Jesus says, okay, and gets in a boat and leaves. Because he doesn't go, you want me to leave? And then just tie him up and be like, no, we're going to deny ourselves. Here we go. Right? He doesn't force himself. It's revelation and invitation. Do you want to respond to what you have seen? So they come back across. He heals the daughter of a rich man, but he also becomes father to a bleeding woman who has no one to advocate for her. That is who he is. And then he takes the 12 that he's been investing in and mentoring and spending every day with, and he goes, not only are you going to watch me do all these amazing things, I'm going to send you out to do the amazing things I do. So they get to go out, and they physically heal people, and they cast out demons too, and they start preaching the good news of this community that he is bringing. And they come back, and they're celebrating everything that's happened, and in response to that, they just miraculously fed 5,000 people. And it's after this revelation, Jesus is talking with them and says, who do you think I am? And Peter's like, I think you're the Christ. And he goes, yeah, let me explain to you what that means. If you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. And so it's about, it isn't, he doesn't open with deny yourself. He shows so much of who he is. And at this point in the journey, this description of discipleship makes sense. But it's a really challenging one. So what's the thing that Jesus says right after this? The transfiguration. Meaning he goes up on the mountain and sort of, I don't even understand. Nobody, look, you read the description of the transfiguration, try to figure out what's going on. All you know is supernatural and it's crazy town up there. Because Jesus goes up on this mountain and he just starts glowing. And then like the greatest prophet and the greatest leader in all of Jewish history show up and they're just having a conversation. And Peter's watching this happen. And he's like, he doesn't have words to describe it. And he's so overwhelmed. He's literally like, should we build a small tent for you here? No, Peter, no. It's not tent time. Like, right, he just like, he has no, like, no frame of reference for, like, where to reach. You know, so he's like, uh. 
And then, literally, it's like the greatest leaders of Jewish history are having a conversation, and then a voice comes down and is basically like, but if you have to listen to one of them, this one, my son. Because every time there is a challenging invitation, there's an even greater supernatural revelation. That is the pattern. And at no point are they ever forced to do it. It is this choice to continue walking forward. So you deny yourself. Lose life to gain it. Now here's the thing. We understand this principle. It isn't that we don't understand the idea that we need to lose life to gain it. It's that we aren't sure that the thing we're gaining when we lose life for Jesus is worth it. See, because think about it. We all, think about, like, why do we love the Olympics, right? Like, why do we love, you know, like, before the Olympic competitions happen, you know, they always do that, like, package, that video that's sort of, like, this person did this, and they worked out like this, and they were separated from their family, and they work out, and they don't eat anything ever except for, like, this super healthy food, and, and then we, and then, and why are they doing, why are they losing so much life? Because the goal of getting a gold medal or winning that prize is worth it. Right, like I have a friend right now who's really into weightlifting and she wants to do like one of the higher levels of like CrossFit weightlifting. So she's literally weightlifting like three to four hours a day. It's a lot of weightlifting. <laughs> I'm still over on the like three pounds um, <laughs> that you can keep in like the trunk of your car. Um, but she, that's lose life to gain. We actually understand that principle. So it isn't when Jesus says that that we're like, oh, we don't understand how that works. It's more that we don't think that, think, think that the thing he's offering is reward enough for losing life. Does that make sense? So then that's what we have to think about. Like, are we carrying an epic vision of the good life? And I don't, not the good life like capitalism good life. Yeah. The good life that is painted, that I just painted a picture of of this radically epic, transformational, radically compassionate, radically turn the world upside down, people from the margins get brought to the center. Yes, it's crazy, you don't know what's going on, but you're casting out demons and people are being physically healed and lives are being transformed. That kind of life. We need to have a vision of that. Mm -mm -mm. Um. Lose life to gain it. Here's the other thing I'll say, is we know that losing life to gain it is a principle that makes sense. The other thing I'll say is that losing life to gain it looks different at different phases of life. So like what it looked like for you to lose life when you were like in your 20s is different than when maybe you're in your 30s and is different than maybe when you're in your 60s. And so what I want to put out there is we need to have the courage to keep evolving and interacting with Jesus about what it looks like to live into this. Uh, when we're young, I think a lot of times losing life or denying ourselves is like basic, like, stop doing messed up stuff, right? I mean, we just call it like, don't, don't sin. And I don't mean in this sort of like, mm -mm -mm, but I mean the like, you know, stop lying, don't steal, don't cheat on people, stop lying to your parents, stop spending 14 hours on video games, like whatever is like a problematic thing in your life. But we act as if that's the whole journey. Like once you get some of the bad stuff out of your life, like I've arrived as a disciple. That's not what following Jesus is about. That's such a narrow and small and undelicious vision of following Jesus. You think Jesus came down to earth and like did all this radical, crazy, passionate, powerful stuff just so you would stop doing dumb things? It's actually to free you from that so you can start doing awesome things. <laughs> Don't you know that? Like, it's not just, we just, we settle for so little. Like, when you, I think about the purity movement, and we're all recovering from the purity movement, you know, and it's like, you think that God invented sex and then wanted to spend all his time trying to keep you from having it? He's like, I invented that stuff. Like, if I wanted to, if I was scared of sex and I thought, like, making babies should just be, like, real, real clinical, I could have made you, people could have had babies just by high-fiving. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, he could have come up with whatever way he wanted to to make procreation happen. But he came up with this pretty, like, crazy, physical, pleasure-connected way. He's not scared of sex. He invented it. But he's like, as the inventor, I have thoughts about how it should be used. So let's talk about it. I'm not here just trying to make rules. I'm trying to help you experience a liberated life. 
I'm not about you just not lying, though you would help if you would stop lying, but don't you know you're supposed to use your words to breathe life into your children, into your family, into your workplace, into this world? Don't you know that your words are supposed to have life-giving power that mirror the creative power of the living God? He doesn't care about you just not lying. He's trying to get you to the place where your words can transform things. Not just trying to get you to, you know, oh, go to church on Sunday, clock a couple of hours. Mm, and then Jesus is like, mm, time card punched of obedience. <laughs> but Jesus is trying to fill you up. Because he has a purpose for you wherever you are. And it's not just to stay out of trouble. That's so small. But it's to bring his liberation, whatever that may look like. I think that, you know, when you're young, it might be like, all right, let's, st you know, stop running the streets and being crazy. But when you get older, I think, I was talking to my husband, and he goes, you know, for me, where I'm at in my life, a lot of denying myself is an internal process, right? Like, as an adult man, he's like, he's gotten a lot of the bad habits out of his life. Like, my husband used to be, like, unhelpfully flirtatious. <laughs> you know, he used to be that guy that was like, this is what he gets for going out of town. Um, <laughs> I just went. <laughs> He don't care. He don't care. But, you know, he used to be that guy that was, like, kind of flirty, like, overly Christian guy flirty. And then when, like, right, when women in the community were like, I think he's interested, he'd be like, but what? I'm just trying to be a friend. <laughs> right? Do you know what I'm talking about? And you'd be like, buddy, I can't point to anything specific, but I know it ain't right. <laughs> and, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And he had done his work. He had done his work. You know why? Because it's not fun to be married to a man who hasn't done that work. <laughs> but it's not just about being married to a guy who doesn't flirt with other people, but it is about being married to somebody who is deeply vested in being present to our relationship. Right? So the work of what it meant for him to be a godly man in our relationship 15 years ago and what it means now has changed. But he's still engaged in that. And the, it's so, I'm so glad that he's not back here cycling like don't be flirty. Because he's done with that means we have room over here to build our dreams together. It means we have room over here to m go towards excellent things, right? Invest our energy not towards just staying out of trouble, but towards like our kingdom dreams. And so it's so much more. Deny ourselves. It's, he, Jesus isn't just about like, you know, trying to be a referee into the joy of your life. He's trying to get you like liberated so you can be a part of transformation. Mm -hmm. Invitation and revelation. I'm not going to tie it all up in like a super cute bow, you know, like, so everybody, I think now we all know what denying ourselves is. It's these 10 things. I respect you too much to do that. But I want to paint a picture that it is an ongoing journey of engagement. And I want to say, I'm not going to say, oh, this is how everyone's supposed to lose life. But you know what? Uh, Mr. Wayne and I were talking about this, and I think it's worth saying. I want to speak particularly to folks who are raising kids. That might be parents, aunts, uncles, grandparents. One of the things I think y'all are doing in ways I think you're invited to deny yourselves is a lot of us are being invited and challenged to parent children in ways that are different than the ways we were parented. To give the next generation something that wasn't given to us. And that means doing a lot of internal work. I'll tell you about a gift that was given to me by my mother. My mom is my dad's, was my dad's third wife. So my divorce was in my family's DNA. And my dad had five siblings, and every single one of them was married many, many times. I'm not bringing this up because I'm trying to judge divorce. But I think anyone who's been di through divorce would say it's a painful thing, and if it can be avoided, it'd be better to avoid it than to go through it. I also think it's really painful for children, right, when your family has gone through divorce. And when I was, I could feel in my parents' marriage that there was momentum towards divorce. Even though no one ever spoke those words, at like eight or nine, I remember I went to my mom and I said, if you want to divorce dad, it's okay. Like, where is that coming from? And I could feel that there was momentum. I don't know how to explain it, but because part of it was there was such an age difference. My mom spent a huge portion of her late 30s and 40s as a caretaker to my dad. It was, very, it was a significant sacrifice that she was making. It was not a typical marriage because of his, his health and age. But she made a choice even though all this momentum was towards divorce and even her own child was saying, like, if you need to, it's okay. But she denied herself. And again, I don't want you to hear me saying some of y'all are in, like, you know, super 
you know, tr situations where divorce might make sense. But in this situation, what I can see is my mom denied herself and she held back that momentum. And now I bear the fruit of that in my own marriage because I didn't experience divorce in my own immediate family. And so I come, I get to start and build off of that in my own marriage. Many of you were not parented excellently or fathered excellently or mothered excellently. And some of the work that you're giving the next generation is you're denying yourself. You're going to therapy. You're doing the work so that the way you parent and invest in the next generation liberates them from some of these patterns, these family patterns. Now that's really, that's a beautiful gift to give to the next generation of folks. And a lot of that might not even look like anything. It might look like your child does something, your grandbaby does something, your niece or nephew does something, and you have an entire dialogue, massive anger, <laughs> want to yell, <laughs> think about raising your hands, take a deep breath, look at that child, seek God. <laughs> take another breath. Realize that all that anger is what you experienced, but it didn't bring life to you, and it didn't necessarily make you any more obedient as a child. Seek God, ask for a different way. Take a breath. Say something in a tone of voice that reflects kindness, that reflects the humanity of this child. Doesn't mean you're letting your child get away with everything, but you're coming in, and you deny those impulses and give away a kind of parenting that's going to raise a beloved child. It's going to raise a beloved child. Denying ourselves is beautiful, and losing life to gain it is beautiful. So I want to close with a vision of a leader that I return to on almost an annual basis. I think about her story because I want to remember that denying myself is about losing life to gain it. It's not just about uh, you know putting myself in a corner and, and listening to terrible music. Um, because all like allowable music used to be like really bad in the 90s. <laughs> a lot of As the Deer, a lot of Maranatha music. Okay, so <laughs> I want to tell you, um, before we go into this final story, I want to go back to some of these definitions and just expand them briefly. So when I was thinking about this, I was like, here's some edits I will make really fast. Can we go to the next slide? Do, 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 next slide. There it is. So a disciple is one who responds in faith. One of the things we talked about in my life group is sometimes we feel like faith is this pressure to just like, even if it doesn't make any sense, you're going to just, you know, obey and gut it out. But I think that what we see Jesus do is P Jesus keeps showing more of himself to Peter. There's a risk every time you step forward in faith, but it's not based on nothing. It's based on what you've experienced and seen of Jesus so far. So there's a difference between seeing nothing and taking an obedient step and taking what you've seen and trusting with courage to move forward with that. It's uh, trusting action even when there are unknowns. And obedience, again, obedience isn't about duty. If my husband was like, I stayed faithful to Erna because I took vows. <laughs> vows, it's what I have to do. You guys wouldn't be like, wow, you're really painting a picture of marriage that is awesome, <laughs> right? But if my husband's like, no, I stay faithful because I love her. Similar, if, God, if we're like obeying God and we're like, oh, I don't even like him and I don't like what I'm doing, people aren't like, wow, God must be wonderful, <laughs> right? Our obedience comes from seeing the goodness of Jesus, the trustworthiness of Jesus. So trusting action because you know God's good and the source of life to the gracious call to follow Jesus Christ. Being a disciple is a lifelong process, that's our Malcolm X example, of dying to self. I wanted to add to this because I think sometimes when we hear dying to self, we need it to be anchored in the reality that we're made in the image of God and deeply loved. Because some of us come from this theology where it's like everything is bad and everything is sinful. But when God looks at creation and when God made you in his image, he said you are good. Now there are pieces of you they need to be pruned. <laughs> there are pieces of you that are not amazing. But when he looks at you, you are good and beautiful and in his image. And so I think we have to go, some of us, when we come from those toxic churches, it's like everything about you is terrible. So you just got to die to yourself. That's not it. You're beautiful and in the image of God and loved. 
but even something like, I mean, where you have a lemon tree. And if you wanted to bear good fruit, I had to prune off even good-looking branches because it doesn't know how to grow in a healthy way. And so I'm helping it by even cutting off stuff that looks healthy, right? So lifelong process anchored in the reality that I'm made in the image of God and deeply loved while allowing Jesus Christ to come alive in us and through us. Right, I think we're most in our purpose when what is in us moves through us into the world. And the person that I love and I look at who I feel like has a clear vision about losing life to gain it and denying herself is Harriet Tubman. Yes. Do you know this woman's story? I mean, for real, for real, do you know Harriet Tubman's story? Because we are about to, can we have some story time, fam? Black History Month, we're about to have a good time. This woman's story is so inspiring. I read a book about 10 years ago called Certain Trumpets. And it explores different kinds of leaders. And in the chapter on radical leadership, Harriet Tubman is the primary example. And he opens with a quote, which is, not many people will vote with their whole lives, give their days and nights, their money and influence to a single cause. But those who do have a disproportionate impact on society. As one would expect from their investment of energy and conviction, compared to the lukewarm or diffident commitments of others, this is why intense minorities often prevail over lackadaisical majorities. <laughs> Harriet Tubman, she was born in 1825. She escaped from the state she was born in, in Maryland, and she became legendary and known as a Moses to her people, bringing them to liberty and freedom. But let's go into some of the details of her life. So, back in the day, children who were born into slavery, let us think about that sentence for a moment. Children who were born into slavery, and that happened for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years on this soil. Children that were born into slavery would be essentially rented out to neighboring plantations to do domestic work. So, Harriet uh, Tubman was basically sent out to do domestic work, but she didn't like it. She knew from early on, she was like, I don't like doing this in-house work. She's like, I like to be outside. I like to, be, I like to use my hands. I like the physicality of that. And so she actually was drawn towards that kind of work. She also was drawn towards the freedom of her people from the very beginning. When she was a relatively young woman, um, she's small. I'm 5'4". She's 5 feet tall. All right, she's 5 feet tall but strong. And um, she was in the store, and so the person in like a local little store, and one of the people there began to beat one of her fellow slaves. And she saw that and inserted herself into the situation to try to get between, protect that person physically. And you got to think about what that would be like as like a five-foot-tall woman and all the power dynamics that are going on there. And the person who worked in the store picked up a two-pound metal weight and bashed her on the head with it. And it put a permanent dent into her skull. It also knocked her out for weeks. And she was like basically comatose for multiple weeks and almost died. And for the rest of her life, she suffered from these catatonic states that came from the result of this long-term brain injury that she suffered. So you didn't know that Harriet Tubman is doing all this liberative work with a physical disability. She only gave one extended interview in her life, but when she, uh, in this interview, she talks about that experience as essentially a kind of being born again that coming back to life on the other side, and it brought clarity to her life. And she has this quote. She said, I had reasoned this out in my mind. There were one of two things. I had a right to liberty or a right to death. She had this clarity of focus and purpose. If I could not have one, I would have the other, for no man should take me alive. I should fight for my liberty as my strength lasted, and when the time came for me to go, the Lord would let them take me. That was her vision statement. <laughs> So she escaped to freedom, and she could have. Would anyone have faulted Harriet if she had escaped from slavery, made it to the north, and then just lived out her life? We would have been like, good on you, Harriet. But she didn't do that. She went back. And did you know that she personally funded all of these rescue missions? That when she was in the north and doing work and people got connected to the Underground Railroad, different folks um, and Quakers would help fund that portion. But when she went back into the south, she had to find the funding for that work herself. She, there's this one story where she goes into this office where she wants, she needs $20 to do some of the, to basically do a rescue mission. And she walks into this office. Um, it's like a, it's, it's supposed to be like an organization that's supposed to help with like freeing, you know, free people who had been freed, freed men was determined at that time. 
and they're basically like, oh, we don't have money. And she sat down, and in this, the author says she basically deliberately put herself into a catatonic state and just stayed there for hours. <laughs> and, then, and then she'd come to and would be basically like, I need that $20. And then she put herself back into this catatonic state, just stayed there for hours. And then when she came two hours later, there was like money sitting next to her. And she was like, and done. <laughs> so she had like a mystical side, which was kind of like, I'm going to do what God gives me to do. And she had a practical side, which was like, and I'm going to get the money I need to do it, however I need to get it. And then she ran her operations with like military precision. She would go back into the South. She understood, in this geography, black folks can be out and about under this pass system. In this geography, black folks can't be about, out and about for any reason at all. So I have to discover the secret roots here. She put all that together. She would go back, get folks. She had to hide when she was coming back into her own home state from her parents so they, they could like not give away, right? not be held responsible if they knew. She went back to get her brother. Well, the first person she went back for was her husband. But he had remarried and would not come with her. Mm. I think there's a lot of editorializing I could do about that. But what I will say is, <laughs> I don't think anyone would fault Harriet if after she went back and she's like, I tried to get my man and he didn't want to come. My work is done. But she did not give up. She went back and she started carrying a gun with her. And the gun had two purposes. The gun was to shoot any people who might be coming after them and shoot anybody who wasn't going to go all the way because it was dangerous and people would get scared the first time she was escaping she brought her brother with her and he got scared in the middle and turned around and went back but that puts everyone in danger so after that she literally had a you cannot turn back rule and her quote was basically like you have two choices i'll kill you or you're going to finish this journey and that's how she ran her operations the thing is, once someone was entrusted to her care, she got them to freedom. And this is a story that the most does not play in my mind. She was going through this town. She did not even know this man, but there was a man who had escaped. He'd been put on trial, and he was going to get sent back to the South. Put on trial. What kind of trial? Anyway, whole justice system is a joke. So, <laughs> so in, the midst of this, in the midst of this court hearing process, he was moved from one building to another. And she d she's just going through, and she sees what's happening, and she's like, my people are not going back to slavery. She doesn't know him, but she's like, this is not it. Five foot tall, runs up to him, and throws herself on his body, making herself a hostage. She starts yelling to the crowd, drag us out, drag us to the river, drown him, don't let him have him. I mean, he was, she was literally like, we gonna drown him or get him free, but this is not happening. I'm sure this dude was like, and, and who are you? <laughs> exactly, ma'am, <laughs> who I did not invite into this scenario. They pry her loose. The crowd starts getting uh, super chaotic, but they get down to the river, and they're able to get her, him into a boat and to the other side. She gets into another boat, goes to the other side. By the time she gets to the other side, he's been captured again, and he's been put inside this building as being held prisoner there, and a mob has come outside the building, and it's like, it's getting crazy. People are taking out guns and shooting into the mob. She goes to the mob cuts through the crowd, literally steps over bodies of people who have been shot, goes into this building, picks up the man who is currently unconscious because he's so kind of like catatonic by all the trauma, carries him out in her arms, gets a horse and wagon, commandeers it, puts him into it, and rides him to the countryside to freedom, thereby keeping her 100% success rate of anyone who's put in her care is going to make it to freedom. Was it costly? Yes. Did she have to deny herself? Yes. But the labor isn't for no reason. It is for her liberation and the liberation of others. She's losing life, not only to gain it personally, but to bring it to her whole community. And that's the kind of clarity of vision we need to have. And I think that sometimes, you know, the systems will lull us into complacency. It's so clear in that situation, you'd be like, yeah, well, yeah, slavery is terrible. We need to get people out of slavery. But you think that we aren't under powers and principalities right now? You think that there aren't demonic systems that we're under now that people need to get liberated from? But we're so comfortable with all this capitalism and we're so comfortable with all this loving stuff and all these different systems that it numbs us to the fact that the work isn't done. Or we're just lulled into hopelessness. Can't nobody change mass incarceration. 
is terrible, but what can be done? I don't know. But people are unjustly, literally still in this slavery prison system. Who will labor until it is ended? Who will do that? Will we deny ourselves and lose life to gain it? So that I hold on to the story of Harriet Tubman because, man, she is a visionary image of a leader who got it. Amen? Who can inspire us not to grow complacent and shows us that denying ourselves is worth it. Malcolm X is a picture of someone who does lifelong learning and doesn't get stuck. And so what I want us to do is we're just closing is I want you to listen to Jesus. Where are you being invited to deny yourself? And not just because, oh, gut it out. But what has been revealed to you about who Jesus is so that this step of denial is actually an invitation? Where are you being called to lose life to gain it? I really think that, as I felt this last service and I felt as I was worshiping as we were starting, I was like, I think in this service too. There are some of us who, because of our traumas from like particularly these very duty-oriented church situations we may have grown up in, have closed the door to really thinking about what would... How are you calling me to lose life, Jesus? And I think we need to just say, that that's actually chaining us. My picture was that people's hearts and souls are just chained up by that. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to come and break that chain. Because staying in that trauma and that hurt, and honestly that lie of what it means to deny yourself, is stealing life away from your soul. And so let's just stand. I want us to worship. I want us to listen to God. Jesus, for any of us who have been stuck by our past church hurt and trauma through these really toxic, duty-oriented contexts. I just want to bring healing and liberation to that, where we've kind of held our hearts back because of those experiences, where we refuse to let ourselves learn a new way and do a different way. Come and bring healing. Break that chain. Break those chains in the name of Jesus. That it's, I feel like it's stunting people's growth. I feel like you want to speak to folks who have believed that following you is just about not doing bad things. No, it's about being invited to glorious things. And so would you keep changing our definition of discipleship, changing our understanding of what it means to follow you?